So, I'm Peter Todd. I do Bitcoin stuff. I guess now that the Craig Wright case is over, I can go say I might or might not be a Bitcoin de core developer. I'll let you guys decide, I'm not a bunch of lawyers. But uh, yeah, I'm going to go talk about one shot replaced by fee rate and uh, his background. Well, why, are, why am I talking about this? Because that's what mempools look like. That's like the... I actually just updated that today. I mean, I say the year of full mempools, but it's what, a year and a half now or so since... Uh, you know, the usual uh, mempool has uh, fully cleared. And of course, what that means is, unlike the assumptions made in many protocols, you can easily now have a transaction that just kind of sits around for, in that case, months, you know? I mean, there's certainly transactions out there that people wanted to uh, mine for like a year and a half now. And of course, that definitely causes problems. Now, well, battery running low. Well, close. All right, well, I'll make this talk quick, how about that? <laughs> so, you know, if you're a consumer wallet, oh, nope, now the clicker doesn't work. There we go, all right. So yeah, so if you're a consumer wallet, you know, the story is fairly simple. You do some fee bumping thing, you know, somehow gets more money for miners, you know, the transaction might get mined and all that. And I actually took a screenshot here of uh, Phoenix because I happen to have Phoenix wallet handy when I took the screenshot. It actually uses child pay for parent, but for sake of argument, let's pretend this is, uh, let's pretend this is replaced by fee. Also, let's pretend the slideshow works. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, what what are we here to talk about? So, replaced by fee and uh, replaced by fee seems really simple enough. And uh, you know, you pay more money. One version of transaction gets in versus another. Presumably, the version that pays more money. Very simple. Um, there is this minor nuance of this full RBF thing where, like, you might go have you know, transactions previously due to political reasons, which were not supposed to be replaced. Like right now, 99-ish percent of miners mine full RBF. So other than the fact that Bitcoin Core hasn't set this by default, this part of the discussion is basically old history now, and I don't really need to talk about it. But I think the more interesting question is, what does that actually mean? Because I've realized talking about replaced by fee rate, a lot of people don't understand the nuance of what more money means. And maybe I'll start with an example. You know, if you have a pure miner and you have a transaction that pays like 100 sats per V-byte fee, and then one transaction pays 10 sats per V-byte fee, are you going to replace the 10 sats per V-byte per, per v fee with the 100 sats? I mean, raise your hand. Does, does that seem like a good idea? All right, okay. Well, all right, you guys are smarter than that. So do you think Bitcoin Core does that? Well, you guys are smart enough to know I'm probably going to say no. Something something law of headlines. And yeah, Bitcoin Core doesn't necessarily do that, even though you know things like mempool.space show it as sats per v-byte. And the issue ultimately is this thing, rule number three of the BIP 125 RBF standard, or you know, it's kind of a mess how this all got defined, but long story short, we call it rule three. And it says that a replacement transaction has to pay at least an absolute fee of at least the sum paid by the original transactions. And why we say sum is, you know, a replacement might invalidate a lot of transactions at once. You know, you can, of course, have chains of transactions, trees of transactions, all kinds of silly things. And if your new transaction conflicts with a transaction, any dependents get tossed to the mempool. And the sum of the fees that they pay, that is the criteria. Do you pay enough money to get rid of this sum? And I'm the guy responsible for this. I wrote the code originally, if I'm not mistaken, that implemented that rule. And certainly at the time, in like, what, 2013 or something, I thought, well, this seems reasonable. Might as well do this at first and, you know, see you later what happens. I might have been setting myself up for trouble. But we didn't really notice this trouble for a while until... Multi-party transactions. And that is Alice and that is Bob. 
Usually not depicted that way, but, you know, it, uh, I think that's reasonable. Alice and Bob. And let's go over a really dead simple type of multi-party transaction, which is a, a coin join. So Alice has TX in, Bob, well, one TX in, Bob has a TX in, Alice has a TX out, Bob has a TX out. Probably not labeled that way because I'd kind of defeat the coin join, but it is what it is. And an issue is if two different entities have authored the same Bitcoin transaction, well, of course, one of them could go double spend it. And since, Al, since Bob and Bob is spending the same TX out, obviously, you know, this so one or the other of the transactions has to get in. I mean, that's really what it comes down to. And coin joins are a relatively benign case like of this, but reasonably easy to understand. And prior to full RBF, you know, one obvious thing, thing that could happen is you could imagine Bob broadcasts his transaction first, and then Alice's software just kind of sits there wondering why the transaction isn't confirming. You know, that's a simple thing that happened. And as long as Bob paid a low fee rate, well, there's no reason for miners to mine that transaction anytime soon. But at least with full RBF, the higher fee transaction would replace the lower fee one. So, you know, that seemed like we fixed that problem. Except for one other issue, which is called rule three pinning. And in this case, Bob transaction is really big. I don't know what he put in there, probably a bunch of inscriptions. But the issue is Bob could have a low fee rate transaction that's just so damn big that the absolute fee is bigger than the high fee rate transaction. And that violates rule number three. You must at least pay for all of the fees in the original one. And I'll get into a bit later why this rule came out, but you know that is that is how Bitcoin Core implements it. Of course, if you're a miner, well, you know this is your job. You're filling up blocks with transactions. Why on earth wouldn't you accept the high fee rate transaction? It's the one that can get into a block now. I mean, there's no guarantee that the low fee rate one will ever get mined. You know, it could have a fee of 10 sats per v byte, which at this rate probably won't be mined in six months. It just doesn't make sense to do this, but that's how Bitcoin Core is. And of course, this kind of economic assumption, I think, infects a lot of things because, you know, even like mempool.space, technically, that's not actually the right display. You know, it's not showing what you really want to go and uh, learn about this stuff because, you know, it's showing it in sats per vbyte. But again, the economics of Bitcoin Core doesn't quite match, doesn't quite match, you know, what we, uh, what miners really want. So, do we have a solution to this problem? Well, what Bitcoin Core recently started implementing is something called V3 transactions. And the idea with V3 transactions is we just go say that large children, large, you know, children that spend unconfirmed transactions, they're just banned. You're not allowed to go create a, a large child if the transaction that it's being, that's spending has transaction version 3. Now, can you see a problem with this? For starters, does it even fix the coin join problem? Like it doesn't. I mean, it, it happens to maybe fix something in a pretty narrow case of lightning transactions, um, or sorry, lightning related transactions, but it's actually a very narrow fix. And there's a lot of debate or how exactly do you fix all the other aspects of this that are still broken? Um, HTLC stuff is an example of this where the transaction you're trying to spend can be confirmed. And if it's confirmed, the whole v3 rule is irrelevant. Uh, another example of this is if you try to do stuff with sig hash, anyone can pay. Well, if you do sig hash, anyone can pay, you're saying anyone's allowed to add, in, 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 add inputs to the transaction. Well, those inputs might be very big. They might be filled with inscriptions. Those inputs can lead to high absolute fee, low absolute fee rate, and your transaction gets stuck. Again, there's nothing v3 cr can really do about this because if you have a protocol doing these kinds of things, chances are you're spending confirmed inputs. There's just no hook for any of this to happen. And there's been proposals to do things like say, well, maybe we'll have V4 transactions where the outputs are not allowed to be spent unless they're by small transactions. But then how do you like avoid making this into a covenant? It's not really clear. So the simpler version, like the simpler fix to this, which honestly has been proposed years ago, is something called replace by fee rate. 
which is, well, why don't you just do the obvious thing and replace it with a fee rate tire? All right, that's what miners want to do. A fee rate tire, just replace it. Now, you might not want to, you know, you probably want to have some limits. Like, you want to be a certain amount higher. Obviously, if it's like 1% higher, well, maybe they can do a whole lot of transactions and do a lot of network traffic. But, you know, if it's like, say, 25% higher or twice higher, certainly that seems reasonable. Well, what are the issues with this? Well, one is minor incentives, which is, you know, imagine if that really big transaction also happens to pay a high fee rate, right? It might be getting mined soon. So in fact, why do you want to go and reduce the amount of total fees at the upper end of your mempool? You know, that's, that's certainly an issue. And there is a lot of complexity here too. Like if you make assumptions about what size miner we're talking about, you know, imagine hypothetically of a miner with like 100% of the hash rate. They know they're going to mine all transactions eventually. So maybe in this case, the fee rate thing doesn't make sense. But fortunately, I think we can make some assumptions here and at least say, hey, there's probably some reasonable version of this. But the other issue is DOS attacks. And I want to go talk a little bit about that. I mean, remember when I said, well, we would want to have some kind of limit so we don't just broadcast transactions over and over again. That's called free relay, free relay attacks. And the idea there is if you're going to broadcast a transaction on the Bitcoin peer-to-peer -peer network, it should cost you something in some way. At the very least, it should tie up some of your money, which kind of in theory has a cost for you know capital. Ideally, you end up spending some money. And there's a really funny example of this that I found years and years ago where Bitcoin Core used to allow transactions to be broadcast on the peer-to-peer -peer network with end lock time set, including end lock time set 4,000 years into the future. Now, how likely is it really that a transaction sitting in a mempool in 2014 that can't be mined for 4,000 years is it really going to actually get mined? No. No, that's just nonsense. Something is going to double spend it eventually. And I did create a whole bunch of those transactions, and I can confirm you I got all those Bitcoin back. So, you know, that was a very extreme example of free relay. But we, well, we fixed that issue by... Uh, requiring things to be mineable. But with replaced by fee rate, you can go play a game of, so imagine if you broadcast a low fee rate transaction that's really, really big, and then you broadcast a slightly higher fee rate transaction that's really small. Well, if the second one eventually gets mined, the ratio of data you have broadcast versus sort of how much you pay compared to the normal rules, is related to what is the biggest transaction you can broadcast versus the smallest. And that's a ratio of like roughly 4,000 to 1, depending on what assumptions you make. And a lot of people go look at that and say, well, obviously, replaced by free rate is completely unworkable. There's no way you could ever possibly do this. You know, we can't, uh, we can't go implement this. Well, that's an interesting thing, because see where I say solution unsolvable? Well, I don't necessarily just mean replaced by fee rate has a problem with this. In fact, Bitcoin Core does too. Sure enough, you know, well, two or three months ago, I was thinking about this stuff and realized, well, there's actually a free relay attack that exists right now, which is because of what's called rule number six, you can only replace a transaction if the fee rate is higher. You can play games where you broadcast a high fee rate transaction and simultaneously a low fee rate transaction. And the nodes that get the low fee rate transaction, but at a high absolute fee, will not go replace one with the other and vice versa. So the free relay thing does actually exist. And it's not even the end of it. I mean, free relay is all over the place. Like if I go broadcast a transaction with the low fee rate and just wait for transa you know, transaction expire out of some miner's mempool. Well, I can also go double spend and you know, get the free relay. I mean, I can go broadcast multiple transactions at once simultaneously. And again, I'm getting free relay. Like this is actually, I would argue, a fairly unsolvable problem. And the reason why it's not an issue actually comes down to the fact that free relay isn't free. You're always gonna either wind up tying up some money and eventually, you're going to wind up spending a UTXO. Just spending a UTXO, even if at this you know, 4,001 rate, is really expensive. 
it is a far more expensive way to DOS tack the Bitcoin network than just renting a bunch of expensive bandwidth at Amazon EC2 and just sending it off to Bitcoin nodes and public network. You know, this isn't a precise one-to-one -one comparison, but I think it gives you a good feeling for why we don't actually have this problem right now, even though it exists in a lot of different ways. So from that, from that thing, I'm not too worried, but, oops, other way, there we go. We can still improve on the basic idea of replace by fee rates and improve the minor incentive thing by saying, well, why don't we do it as a one-shot deal, all right? Why don't we only do the replacement if the new fee rate is high enough? It'll probably get mined in the next block or two. And that really comes down to being able to determine if you sort transactions or transaction packages or however you want to do it by fee rate, what is the lowest fee rate it's going to take to get into the next block or maybe the next two blocks, assuming two get found, you know, found immediately after another. If you can figure out that number quickly enough and efficiently enough, you can just do the comparison that way. And from the point of view of protocols that want to fix this problem, remember that what they're trying to do is make sure a transaction gets mined. They're not trying to just like broadcast it to eventually be mined. No, it's like something like Lightning where it needs to be mined by a deadline. So they're broadcasting transactions. They're going to be mined pretty quickly or not at all, in which case they're going to broadcast later with higher fee rate. So I think this is a reasonable idea, except the implementation is kind of hard because of how we've structured the mempool data structure. There is no easy way in Bitcoin Core at the moment to just say, hey, you know, give me the highest fee rates, but at the bottom of the first, you know, four, yeah, four weight units of mempool. Like there's just no mechanism to do that. In the future, there probably will be because people are doing something called package relay or not package relay. What was it called again? I'm totally blanked on this. Anyway, there's a future like cl cluster relay. Yeah, the cluster relay mempool stuff will probably change these data structures to let you just get this number quickly and efficiently. And you know, maybe I'll do some modifications to that later, but there's also other alternatives too. Like you could imagine like a replace by fee rate that only kicks in after a certain period, all right? Because if a transaction be sitting around for like three blocks, chances are that's because the fee rate's too low to get mined. Now it's kind of hacky to say, well, you only can replace it after that time period expires. But I mean, I believe this is easy to implement. I haven't actually tried yet, but I, it can probably be done. And also it kind of fits like the economics. It's really like the whole purpose of this is to let progress be made in protocols. Well, if we haven't waited long enough to try to make progress, do you really need to broadcast that transaction? You know, maybe we can wait a little longer. And speaking of uh, what's possible to implement, well, I do have an implementation. It's part of uh, my Libra Relay fork, which also does uh, one kind of curious thing, which is removes the limits on op return. And it was kind of a funny story how this got created, because of course, you know, the whole ordinal description business. Well, some people kind of got a got to be in their bonnets over how the op return limits are all very paternalistic. And someone was willing to go pay me to go and implement a lower, you know, a unre um, unrestricted op return fork of Bitcoin Core. And for f full RBF, I already had a fork that did what's called, um, you know, full RBF peering, which it makes sure it advertises a service bit, ensures it's connected to other nodes advertising that service bit. Well, I just took that code, reworked it for Libra Relay, and now Libra Relay nodes advertise this Libra Relay service bit, and they all make sure they're connected to each other. And thus, even though they're a tiny minority, transactions reliably propagate to that tiny minority. I mean, I'd guess, you know, there's probably less than 50 Libra Relay nodes running on the network right now, probably less than that. But it is enough because of this peering code for them to reliably connect. And because I wanted to go test out replaced by fee rate, well, I added that code to that too. So if you go to that branch and download the code and run it, you know, you'll run a node on part of that. At some point, I might go and improve this stuff and, you know, for instance, add to a readme, maybe make some pre-compiled versions and stuff, but... That doesn't have to have to happen immediately. And eventually I would like to see Bitcoin Core implement some version of replace by fee rate into Bitcoin Core itself. Maybe the one shot version, maybe someone, maybe something with an expiry time. The important thing is it's just such a simple idea 
The implementation is actually really simple and it just solves transaction pinning extremely thoroughly. I mean, I could be mistaken on this. I haven't actually tried testing it, but I believe we've solved all the other transaction pinning vectors that are notable, that are relevant to things like Lightning. So once we get this merged, we're done. And we don't need all the complexity of V3 or whatever things come after V3. And with that, thank you. Questions? Good. I've explained everything. All right. Well, I think we're short of time. Oh, wait. Uh oh. Yeah. 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 Well, you know, like, I've known you for a while. You seem to be a reasonably smart person who understands some economics. And if you assumed it worked that way, because obviously that's how you make more money, I'm probably on the right track. And frankly, transaction replacement's the same deal. You know, I had the same kind of interaction probably, what, 10 years ago, trying to go advocate for transaction replacement, period. It's like, well, obviously miners would mine the one with more money. Right, you mean the code doesn't do that? Why? Like, and sure enough, when it became a big deal with weird inscription bidding systems, you know, spending literally thousands of dollars per block on full RBF replacements, well, what do you know? Like 99% of miners, maybe 100% now, have turned on full RBF, even though Bitcoin Core hasn't. But it is what it is. Uh oh. Yeah, well, so basically, I'm not going to get I'm not going to get exact details right, but essentially, what's happening is they have this sort of um, what's effectively an auction system where you know if you have one of these inscription assets, you can go say, hey, I want this amount of money for that, and there can be cases where essentially people can underbid and like get more valuable things by replacing one transaction with another. And long story short, well, if that's true, the way you do transaction replacement in the full RBF world is you just pay a higher fee, and then full RBF nodes don't care whether this bit, you know, bit, bit one twenty five end sequence thing is set. So it just gets higher and higher fees. And from a point of view of miner, like I would argue, this actually prevents miner exploitable value because what it's really doing is it's saying the value that would go to the clever person who understands the market and how to bid flows to the miner because there's two or more clever people who understand the market and know how to bid, and they're taking all the extractable value and sending it to transaction fees. So from the miner's point of view, turning on full RBF means you don't do, have to do anything to get the maximum amount of value out of these transactions. It's perfect. Now, obviously, there'll be slight cuts that goes to whoever you know, gets the last bid, but you don't have to do any work to get like 99% of the way there. So yeah, full RBF is very nice for that. And no wonder 99% plus have turned it on. You had a question? I believe it is, but only if you turn non-standard transactions on. Like I think, if I remember correctly, the way they did it is all the codes there, but except for the code that considers a V3 transaction to be standard. I could be wrong on this, but I think, I think that's a nuance there. And this is why like nobody is using it yet on mainnet because you know code's out there, but it's, it's just wor you know, it's useless right now. And frankly, I suspect I will win this argument and all this V3 code will at one point just get ripped out and thrown away. And depending on how much it's used, it might end up being a weird quirk where like suddenly V3 transactions are standard too. But that is what it is. No? Thank you. Yeah.